I'm Caitlin Palachek and I'm with Cook County Health. Thank you for joining us. If you need help with an appointment or have a medical question, you can reach our health system at 312-864-0200. That's 312-864-0200. My guest tonight is Mary Sadak, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Integrated Care Services at Cook County Health. Welcome to the show. Hi. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about what you do at Cook County Health? As the Chief Operating Officer for Integrated Care Services, I manage a group of teams that support patients in several different areas. So for example, we have multiple teams that are community-based that are out providing care coordination services for members who need additional support outside their regular medical visits. We also have another team that is involved in access, and so they run a call center that's 24 hours a day in order to support patients connecting with their medical homes. And then lastly, I think we have another team that works um, to help the folks who are justice involved so that they can um, have linkages to community-based resources. Cool. And how did you get interested in this area? Oh, for a long time I've been really interested in care that takes place outside of a hospital, um, in the home or in the community, and I've also partnered that with efficiency and effectiveness, so this just seems a natural um, fit to me. Mm -hmm. And how would you say homelessness affects health care today? Um, it affects health care in um, a number of ways. So if you think about um, cost, it's way more expensive to take care of people who are not housed um, in a stable manner, who are um, also may have multiple conditions such as diabetes or heart disease, or they may have a mental health issue. And so their, their lack of housing just makes everything that much worse. In addition, people who are housed are extremely vulnerable to violence um, or safety-related issues, and so their lives are constantly at risk as they work to try and survive, just to find a safe place to be or um, food to eat. Okay, and then have there been any national studies between showing the correlation between homelessness and how it affects healthcare today? The, um, the original study was done in 1988 by the Institutes of, of Medicine, which is a very prestigious organization. And the interesting thing is, is that 30 years plus later, it is still a major policy and challenge for a social service delivery. And so, um, through that time though we've learned a lot and one of the things is that we've learned is that people who have been chronically homeless and that's defined as people who've been unhoused for two years or longer um, they are they are in need of what they call permanent supportive housing services and so these are a group of wraparound services that are both medical and behavioral in nature and so over time they have found that by studying people and looking at how they do in terms of their engagement with their communities their ability to keep their doctor's appointments um, and to live independently that the permanent supportive housing has been a really successful model for them and so we've kind of it's it wasn't that there was a piece of landmark um, research that led people that way, but it actually came through people's experience and expert, um, you know, discussion and dialogue that led us to this place. And so that's the model that we are currently supporting today. Okay. And when and how did Cook County Health become involved in addressing affordable housing for its patients? So I think that the providers at the health system have always been interested in the housing situations um, that their patients face, mainly because it provides, um, it's another variable to account for when you're taking care of someone. And sometimes the lack of housing influences the treatment that a patient can receive. But um, more importantly, recently we did a study where we took the folks that were in the HMIS database, which it houses um, the information about people who are looking for housing, and we compared that to our medical records at the health system. And what we found is that over 80% of the patients in that database were actually um, served by Cook County Health at one time or another in the recent past. So this is something that um, influences what we do. It influences how we organize our services and the practices that we have. And I think because we're an integrated health system that includes a public health department as well, 
well as um, a correctional health services, we get to see the impact of homelessness in um, across a spectrum that might not be available to other people. And how do people, did you say, get into that database? So usually they're registered. Um, so at the health system, for example, we have people who have been trained in order to um, access the system and do what is do an assessment that basically um, assigns a vulnerability index to the people that they're working with. And this is, the, this is what starts their entry into housing. So is the vulnerability... Like it indexes at like a one through 10 or what does that look like? It has a score and it's based on how many medical problems they have, what mm -hmm. their hospitalization patterns have been, how long they've been homeless. Um, and so, and as a health system, because we have so many of these patients, we are actually able to update the information so that the information in the system is most current, which can change where people are on the list. Okay. And how would you say the program's involved, evolved since its inception? I think that um, the, the first thing is, is that we recognize that despite our great doctors, our beautiful facilities, our caring staff, that um, there's only so much that we can do for a person who's not stably housed. And so the research has shown that about 20% of health outcomes are directly related to the care that's provided in a healthcare setting. Another 30% is related to things that we may be able to do to change patients' behavior. So for example, exercise or quit smoking and the rest of it is really around what's known as social determinants of health and so being being unhoused is a social determinant um, there are other ones such as behavioral health food insecurity in you know inadequate heat etc so I think that um, you know all of this informs what we do and how and how we build our program and we want to look for a partnership um, and a balance and an approach that re that reflects what the research tells us can you tell a little bit to our viewers at home that don't know what a social determinant of health is or means so social determinants are those things that are present in the place where people live or they work. And it has to do with things such as as basic as parks or maybe the caliber of the schools or whether or not there's economic opportunity. Um, are there grocery stores that have fresh vegetables? Um, you know, is the housing stock safe? Um, is it in good repair? Is there public transportation? Those are all things that support a, a, a healthy lifestyle. The ability to have a job, to have your children educated, to be able to go to the park, to exercise, sidewalks to walk on, um, a way to get around if you don't have, have your own car. So those are things that influences people's ability to, to stay healthy. Without them, the healthcare delivery system can only do so much. Okay. And to date, how successful have you, has the program been with placing patients in affordable housing? So I think we've been fairly successful. We've started incrementally, and we started um, about a year and a half ago with um, getting people housed in the suburbs. And we've so far we've housed about 60 um, individuals and families. And um, we've learned a lot from those experiences. So when we work in healthcare, we kind of have our own jargon and our own time frames and a way that we work. And so it's been really enlightening and helpful for us to understand how people community based organizations work and how they approach their work, but also how we can figure out how to support them and their mission. So it's been a collaborative process. Um, and we look forward to it. Currently, we have two projects. Um, one is the flexible housing pool, and another one is a, our housing vouchers that have been made available to us through the Housing Authority of Cook County. And between both of those, we will be able to house over 100 either individuals or families. So it's 100 units. Um, and it requires a lot of work. Um, the folks have to, we have to help them gather their documentation. Um, you know, they need help selecting their place. We need to make sure they have a bed to sleep on or furniture. Um, and then we also wrap, they have the permanent supportive housing services, which then enable them to make sure that they stay stably housed, that they're connected to the care and the services that they need in order to be successful. And how does Cook County Health select these specific people? Are there, is there a wait list and it's first come first served? Like what's the selection process like of 
who gets placed? It really depends upon who's who's providing the housing. And so, for example, um, with the Housing Authority of Cook County, one of the requirements was that um, somebody in the house be declared disabled um, because we know disabled people oftentimes have challenges remaining stably housed, um, mainly due probably to economic issues. So, um, but anyway, so th the funders kind of set what what the population mm -hmm. is that we're going to house and then we work with with that authority or that organization in order to meet their needs and their requirements to help people um, get housed. I think that um, you know with the flexible housing pool it's a little bit different um, yeah. that population has been identified as people who have a lot of system usage meaning that they've been in the emergency room um, or the hospital frequently or maybe even justice involved and so um, they their data has been um, collated and put into a list and then they've been placed in cohorts and we're currently working through these cohorts to identify whether or not people are still interested in pursuing housing. Can you list a few of the other community partners? Because you were talking about the Flexible Housing Association. Yeah, there. Um, I hope I don't offend somebody because there's quite a few of them. You know, we have funding from J.B. Pritzker. Mm -hmm. We've got um, the Housing uh, All Chicago. Um, we've got the Suburban Alliance. We've got the Center for Supportive Housing. Um, we've got obviously have our own health system. We've got the Housing Authority of Cook County and resources within the county that help us with housing. There's quite a few people mm -hmm. who are involved in making this successful. Excellent. And do we have statistics that show that this is a that this is a successful program? So there's been a lot of work done on this, and there's also a little bit of um, you know discussion or dialogue around this, and. Um, we think that housing people is the right thing to do from a quality perspective, a quality of life, um, and to make our communities better. Um, some people have found that that argument is not enough to carry the day for the cost that's associated with helping people reestablish housing. And so there's recently been a lot of work done to establish the cost effectiveness of housing. So we are in the process of understanding that from a system perspective. We do have people who use the health system a lot who appear to be un un unstable unhoused or unstably housed mm -hmm. and um, so we are looking at that but our preliminary results from the work that we've done in the last 18 months indicate that people are doing well um, and that their experience is starting to look like the experience in other housing organizations across the country. So more to come on that. Our clinical research unit at the health system um, wants to do a good job to make sure the conclusions that we arrive at are concrete and so um, we should have more on that probably in another six to nine months. Excellent. We'll have to have you back on the show. Okay. So I know that Cook County Health just recently pledged $1 million toward the Chicago and Cook County Flexible Housing Pool. What will this do for our patients? Well, I think it'll do a lot. Um, I, first of all, it will make more housing units available for um, the folks that don't have access to housing and it will sp the flexible housing pool will operate it started in the city but then will also move to the suburbs so there will be opportunities for people to support them where they would like to live mm -hmm. um, people who have been in the city tend to want to stay there and people who've been in the suburbs are likewise so right. this allows us an opportunity to do something for the people that we serve I think apart from that I think it sets the health system um, if the health system can find the money to um, support this effort, hopefully it will encourage other organizations. Homelessness is a community-wide issue. It is not exclusive to Cook County Health or the people we serve in Cook County. Um, and it's going to take a community-wide solution to help us um, remedy this. And basically, it's a pretty expensive proposition because we don't have enough affordable housing stock. And so we try and use what we have. Um, and leverage the opportunities that we have, but there will still need things that will have to be built if we're really going to get you know, to zero homelessness in Cook County. So hopefully this will encourage others to consider this um, as an opportunity for their organization or the people that they serve mm -hmm. um, in order to support the entire community. Okay, and how do you work with outside organizations to make this program work so well for Cook County Health patients? 
So I think, as I mentioned before, the um, you know working in a healthcare system, we work kind of on a different time frame. You know, we work mm -hmm. in minutes, um, sometimes seconds, um, and then mostly days. And so we ex we hope that patients respond to treatment, or we're able to make them more comfortable um, in a set amount of time. Being homeless um, is something that seems to stretch for an eternity, and it takes a while. Um, to get things underway. And so right. one of the things that we've had to work with is to to be a good partner and a collaborator is to kind of get in sync on time frames. So we're hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And they're like, this is complicated. This is um, not a marathon. It is a slow walk and a deliberate walk so that we can make sure that we do everything correctly the first time, that the mm -hmm. papers are all in line and documented so that the patient or the person that we're working with flows through the process smoothly. So I think part of that is understanding um, is understanding the difference in time frames. I think the other part is trying to leverage the strengths that each organization has. So the people who work in this um, community with folks that are homeless really understand what that's all about and what that means. And we're used to people in beds. And so we don't necessarily have the same kind of understanding. And so they get to educate um, us about what this means and how important how some things that we might not think are important really are important and do make a difference. I think for them um, what we bring to the table is we bring a wealth of expertise about chronic disease, around wellness, around access to care, um, and what's essentially possible to do in the home or in the hospital. And so between the two of us, we can put together a pretty good plan for people to keep them safely and effectively in their homes. Excellent. And what are some barriers that you still see with your patients that struggle when finding housing? I think one of the barriers is money um, because even when um, somebody agrees to pay your rent, it's still really expensive to move. And many of these folks have had kind of, um, you know, almost a downward spiral where one bad thing happens, they lose a job or somebody in their family gets sick and needs a caregiver and they have to quit their job and then they wind up losing their housing because they don't pay their rent. And it's, and so maybe there's a utility bill that isn't paid. And so prior to getting a new unit, you have to make sure that you're in good standing with utility companies mm -hmm. and it's like there's a limited number of them. Um, and it's not optional like a cable TV, right? Like you have to have heat and, and um, electricity. And so I think, you know, and there's expenses to moving and then people need things to sit on or sleep in or cook in and, you know, getting your household reestablished is expensive. Right. Um, there's a lot of startup costs and there's a lot of extra effort. So I think that, I think that's a challenge for people. We try and work through that the best way we can by leveraging organizations that support these kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then I think the other thing is, is just about the whole trauma of, being unhoused and now being housed and maybe having to move and get used to something new. I know with the flexible housing pool, there's really an emphasis on trying to have people be where they want to be, which is probably the neighborhood that they're familiar or closest to. So um, those are some of the barriers that we've encountered as we've worked with patients, I think, um, and clients. I think, you know, the other thing is, is whether or not there's enough affordable units that are in good enough shape for people to actually to, to live in and whether or not there's schools nearby if it's a family or those kinds of things. Right. And then what types of diseases do you commonly see in patients who live in poor housing conditions? Well, it depends. Um, a lot of people in poor housing have that have cardiac or respiratory challenges have a lot of issues with mold. You know, kids have asthma. Um, that when the heating systems probably don't work really well, so it may be a real extreme of temperatures, which if you're a little challenged from a harder respiratory perspective can be very, very hard. Mm -hmm. I think that in other cases where you have, um, the public health department will tell you that when they're seeing clients that there are many, because of the cost, there's many people living in a particular unit. And um, if somebody has an infectious disease, then that, that can be a problem it because there's spread. not enough space right okay and then what do you say that our viewers at home can do to help with this problem 
Well, I would say, um, first of all, to try and understand the issue and, and know that um, many people live just a paycheck away um, from being homeless. But the other thing is, is that if you happen to have an apartment or you're a landlord, I would strongly encourage you to think through um, participating in our programs and helping our um, folks get stably housed. I think you will make such a difference in somebody's life. It's unbelievable. And um, there are some hoops to, you know, to jump through, you know, not onerous, and we're here to help to make that process go smooth um, for you as well as for um, the person that you might consider renting your apartment to. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, supporting the charities that um, work in this arena are really Im important. Um, I think patients are incredibly grateful after they've been through a trauma like this to have a place to call home. I think for those of us that this isn't an issue, I don't know that we fully appreciate how lucky we really mm -hmm. are. What would you say would be a worry of a landlord possibly participating in this program and how could they overcome it? Well, a lot of, um, I think some of it has to do with maybe with property damage. Like, is this person going to take good care of my property? Is this person going to be a good tenant? You know, are they going to follow whatever rules there are? Those mm -hmm. kinds of things. I think most of the time that, that folks do really well. I know that um, in some cases where there's a concern about damage, there's been a fund that's been established in order to make the landlord whole again if somehow their property gets damaged. So, um, Oh, when I've talked to some folks, they say that they are amazingly impressed with how flexible and, um, you know, accommodating the landlords really, really are, and so which works to the benefit of our clients. And so, just to be clear, if I was a landlord and I had a property and I was renting it out, I would be receiving payment on time every single month. Right. Do you think that that would be a concern too? I think so, but I think once they know that they're that the rent is going to be paid, mm -hmm. I think that kind of takes that off okay. off the table. And then I think the next issue is 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 this person going to be a good tenant? Take care of my home. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So is there anything else you want to add about the work that Cook County Health is doing to get patients adequate housing to improve their health? I would I would say that I think we're really excited to embark on this journey. Um, we had a housing summit at the health system a couple weeks ago to kind of talk about our work, to talk about some of the challenges that are associated with housing. There was a panel of physicians um, and clinicians who kind of talked about what it's like to care for people who are homeless and how that impacts the care that they provide. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm in um, the room. I also think that there is an incredible commitment um, from all sectors who work on this particular issue to make to make it better. So we're excited to embark on this and to um, learn more. I think it also allows us to provide a more comprehensive approach to care for our patients um, because we can deal with them and whatever kinds of issues that they're bringing. And if we can't do it ourselves, we have partners who are willing to assist. And how can people learn more? They can actually what they could do is they could call the number that you posted um, okay. and we will have somebody take a message and route that message um, for you. We do have a housing team that that is at the health health system um, that's working on these projects and so they would be able to get back to you. Cool. And then could somebody learn more on our website as well? Yes. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. This was very insightful. I hope that everybody at home learned something. And if again, if you need help with any type of patient care, you can call our Patient Support Center at 312-864-0200. That's 312-864-0200. Thanks again for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.